Well, good afternoon again, everyone. Good afternoon. We're going to get started with our program. I'm going to start with a, a few recognitions and some announcements as well, and then we'll get right into uh, our panel for today's uh, program. I'm Tom Haas, and uh, very pleased to be chairing the Econ Club uh, this particular year, and also understanding its role in our community through these past over 43 years of service to uh, Grand Rapids and West Michigan. So really appreciate what we're able to do. And I think our new watchwords uh, really says it all, connect, inform, and inspire. As uh, if you were here last uh, week, we were able to uh, uh, share with you our, our new mission and what we're doing in terms of really becoming, in fact, more relevant uh, uh, with our programming and with the connecting connections that we make with one another. I want to start off by saying a special welcome to our board members and the past club uh, chairpersons in the audience today. Uh, thank you for your service uh, through these uh, uh, years of this, of this club. And also welcome uh, new members as well. I think you're right here. And so thank you for, uh, for joining us as well. Thank you. <laughs> and, and if you want to see it up front just like them, Think about membership. It works, right? Yep, they're shaking their heads. Okay. Uh, we are also um, pleased to this year again partner with GRPS. Uh, we have uh, students uh, who are on the dean's list, and we host a table for them for each of our luncheons. So let's uh, congratulations uh, to them as well. So I think we, uh, we do have uh, an excellent program today. Uh, we're going to be hosting a, a distinguished uh, panel of three city mayors. They're going to talk about inclusive growth, uh, communities, and new strategies for prosperity. Uh, so I'm going to thank uh, here, and I'll introduce Juan here in a second, but I want to thank Juan Alvarez, our dis uh, distinguished scholar in residence of the Dor Dor Dorothy A. Johnson Center for Philanthropy at GVSU, who will really assist in bringing this program together for us, Juan, so thank you. Our schedule for the upcoming uh, weeks uh, is exciting. On October 7th, uh, we're going to have another panel presentation on a very, very contemporary topic, and that is criminal justice reform. October 28th, we're going to host Brian Sheath, president of Vista Equity Partners, uh, talking about the venture capital and the important space for startups in our community and entrepreneurs. And October 4th, we're going to have Vince Staley of Patagonia here. And he's going to share stories about uh, his well-known company. And also, you may uh, know that he was the author uh, co-author of the responsible, responsive, responsible company. So for those, again, that aren't members, let's uh, think about that possibility uh, because what we really have to offer here are great networking opportunities, wonderful uh, programming, and I think uh, you will take away something every time you come to one of our programs and lunches. So th thank you for considering that. And finally, I want to thank... Um, those who are our seasoned partners, and you've seen those uh, scrolling on the screen behind us, Aon, Consumers Energy, ITC Holdings, Miller Johnson, and PNC Bank. Uh, your support of this club and community is very appreciated. Let's recognize them, please. Now I want to get uh, right on with the program, uh, and I want to uh, introduce uh, Juan Alvarez. Uh, Juan is, as I mentioned, an individual who uh, is now with the Johnson Center, is a distinguished scholar. I've uh, known Juan since uh, 06 when uh, he welcomed me into his office at GRCC. And I remember that distinctly. Uh, he uh, was one of those leaders here that uh, I knew uh, I could uh, lean upon during those uh, first uh, uh, months and weeks and years as we grew together in our respective roles and responsibilities. Then he moved uh, on to uh, Kalamazoo and then back to Aquinas, and now he's with Grand Valley. And I'm, I'm thrilled to have an individual of, uh, of his stature. He is, uh, in, in fact, no doubt, a leader of character. 
in this space, and he's bringing a wealth of experiences uh, to the Johnson Center. I couldn't be happier about that. So I'm going to uh, now invite Juan to come forward, and we'll start with the program. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, T. Haas. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, taking the time to be here this noon. The Johnson Center for Philanthropy at GVSU is honored to be here in front of you today. We have really uh, worked hard to put this presentation together, and we've invited three outstanding mayors here from Michigan to uh, lend their uh, input and uh, perspective in terms of their communities. They will help convey the need and value in creating inclusive growth communities. This panel discussion is going to be led by Dr. Behrens. Dr. Behrens is the executive director of the Philanthropy Center at GVSU. I will bring up the mayors in just a minute along with Dr. Behrens. But uh, let me give you a glimpse of what the program looks like uh, today. So uh, I'm going to be setting the stage by presenting some data and information on our topic. Then we'll hear from our mayors, and then I'll be back up for some closing comments. So let's begin the program by uh, watching this video that will help me set the stage. I'm an economist. That means I spent a lot of my life looking at data. I look at efforts made to improve the job market, what efforts have succeeded and what efforts have failed and why. And I look at past trends, which help us anticipate future challenges. As has often been said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Looking at past trends might at least give you some clue about the future. So what we're going to do today is share with you data on past trends data that is highly suggestive about the future labor market and society we must deal with. Dramatic change can happen and has happened in one lifetime. Today, the lifetime we're looking at is yours and mine. I was born in the 1950s and graduated high school, let's just say around 1970. I'm not alone. There are many individuals listening right now who also fit that description, and I'll take a minute to name a few of my fellow boomers, like Diana Seeger, or Dave Custer, or Mark Murray. As we looked around at our fellow graduates at the time, on average, we could have measured that only 16.5% of the population were people of color. For some of you, that number may sound hard to believe, but it's true. 83.5% of the population was Caucasian. We would have had a similar economic outlook for the generation of people born when we were in the early 1950s, close to 80% of us would earn more in our lifetimes than our parents did, just as our parents did better than our grandparents. By the time we were entering college in the early 1970s, the generation born in those years only had around 61% doing better than their parents. A big drop, but still a majority of the population. In the mid-1970s, as many of my generation were completing college, there was, of course, college debt. But its total value for the nation was only $5 billion. Even for many good jobs, a post-secondary education was optional, not required. As a result, only 19.3% of the population had earned an associate's degree or higher. At the time, median household income was just under $50,000. But times have changed. Let's jump forward to today, 2019, just to see how our nation has transformed for the typical high school graduate. Today, our nation's population consists of 40% being people of color. That's an enormous increase in roughly 50 years within one lifetime. Furthermore, the number of individuals doing better than their parents has shrunk from 80% for those born around 1950 to around 60% for those born in the early 1970s to around 50% for those born in 1980 and beyond. Think about what that statistic means. If only 50% do better than their parents, 
50% do worse than their parents. In some cases, much worse. In addition, college debt has absolutely soared from that 1970 amount of $5 billion to over $1.5 trillion, $1.5 trillion today. That is a comparison so great that I'll disappear as we illustrate the difference. And what about the importance of having some level of advanced training after high school? The percentage of individuals who now have at least an associate's degree has climbed to 42%, in part because today, additional training is essential to getting a good job, one that pays enough that you can support a family. But even with our much higher educational attainment, since 1970, median household income has remained stagnant. After 40 years, it hasn't risen up to $60,000. People are running faster and faster in an attempt to move ahead, but they are not succeeding in doing so very much. So what does this mean for a typical high school senior starting off a college career today? Let's meet a few. The present day equivalents of my boomer colleagues from 1970 and hear from them what they're facing. Well, I've always lived in Grand Rapids. I moved to East Grand Rapids, so that's where I graduated and everything. I'm the first um, kid to go to school, but yeah, like both my parents have like their degrees and stuff like that. In my mind, taking out loans, I mean, it's obviously not fun or anything like that. And I figured that's kind of like a given, especially like today that most people are gonna have to go into it. I guess my dad still has loans, you know, that he's paying for. But I mean, I figured I was gonna have to do it either way. And I wanna go into like film or like editing videos and stuff. I really like to do that. Like I hope to have enough. Like I don't really expect anything to be like, I'm gonna be rich and famous one day. Like people to provide for myself and everything like that. My grandparents, they're from Mexico. They moved here, then my parents met. I'm the first one to actually graduate from high school and then for generation two also go to um, college. My first semester, it was hard to start because like my parents, they tried their best to help me, but they didn't have the experience. I work in the mornings. In the afternoons, I finish doing my homework. It's like too much pressure because my parents, every day I see them um, work hard and struggle just to give us uh, food. And I also like think like maybe I should just work more hours in McDonald's so I can help my mom as well. I know I want to do something in the medical field. So maybe I could um, be like a medical assistant and just go up the level, you know, to hopefully be a doctor so I can make them proud. Neither of my parents graduated. I try and base some of my goals off of their accomplishments, but they really only accomplish so much. But that's one of the, the reasons I'm driven as well, is because I want to achieve a lot more than, than they were able to. I feel like I have to work harder than everybody else to be noticed at the same level. I got really heavy into making music my freshman year and decided that that's the area I want to continue my a career path in. I guess the biggest thing that, that has been stressful for me, the fact that I only have 24 hours in a day. I was working part-time over the summer, but um, I had to pay for school, so uh, I just picked up a third shift, uh, working 40 hours a week, um, just because that's the only schedule that I can work full-time, get to school, get a little bit of sleep. I do feel like uh, we deal with a lot more challenges than our parents did. Just trying to stay away from all this like stress and having a lot of anxiety and stuff. As you can see, these young individuals are facing challenges we couldn't have dreamed of when we graduated from high school. And what they are facing pretends particular challenges for our nation. First, take a look at how much the percentage of people of color is going to grow by 2044. Individuals like Dayan and Leslie will be in the majority, comprising over 50% of our population. At the same time, if we do nothing, it is quite plausible that the current reality of only half the population doing better than their parents will continue or even worsen. It seems likely that we will have a society with many more citizens of color, but many of them with lower levels of economic success. 
The median incomes of blacks and Hispanics are not just below where Caucasians are now, they are below where Caucasians were in 1970. And yet college debt will continue to grow as those striving to do the best they possibly can incur greater tuition and training costs. The data paints a picture. History reinforces that picture, either for the better or for the worse. And for the sake of ourselves and the next generation, young men and women who will succeed within our lifetimes, we need to commit to solutions that are more inclusive. The competitive differences between our companies can be advantages. So let's say, for example, one company is more inclusive than another. The data says they'll thrive. They will do better. If, if we have our great transportation, it's, it, all businesses, all boats rise if we do that. This is the same category with the notion of in inclusion and thinking about diversity. So the weight of the problem can be offset by the, the collegiality or the, the coming together of really what I would say powerful people with lots of resources. Well, what I'm most proud of in West Michigan, in the business community, is I know the hearts of all these people, which is they are at large in service of others. So it's got the right underpinnings for being one of the best places for inclusion because this is an in-service kind of requirement. You've got to see your job is to enable and empower here. And so I believe that part of the world will step up and be one of the leaders in the world doing this. I guess just having more, because I feel like scholarships are so limited, it'd be cool if there was just more people could, that could have access to them. That would be nice. <laughs> One thing that a lot of people of my generation would ask for, I wouldn't ask for a handout, more so an opportunity, like a day-to-day -day mentorship, you know, an insight to how one can become successful. My parents are working hard for us. Um, they would tell me, we want you to be something in the world, something better than us. You have the great opportunity. We want you to be useful, something more. Be something more. I want to thank the Upjohn Institute and uh, GRCC and Jim Hackett for helping us produce this video. The last statement that that uh, young student made was, be something more. Isn't that what all parents want of their children? And that's what all young people want for themselves. The worsening trends highlighting that were highlighted in this video illustrate the growing inequity in communities around the United States and also in our own. Through these inequities, they've been long-term. We've had them for a very long time. But current demographic shifts deepen the impact of these inequities. As a growing percentage of our population is left with less, we are all left worse off. Therefore, this must be everyone's responsibility. The research and outcomes we're studying at the Johnson Center are clear about the value of dealing with inequities at the micro level, the community level, whether that's a city or a region. In addition, evidence suggests that collaborations through coalitions across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors are the critical factor in tackling this complexity and creating communities of success. These coalitions have a unique ability to address barriers to access and opportunity for more. Inclusive growth means that more people share in the rewards of a growing economy and community. Inclusive growth communities are those that invest through philanthropy, public policy, financial decisions, and community commitments in the success of efforts like workforce training and talent development, entrepreneurship and small business success, personal financial security and access to financial resources, neighborhood development and growth, transportation and access, and reducing gaps among different populations in health, education, and housing. 
To be truly successful, we must pay attention to the full continuum of building our human capital, known as talent development. We must acknowledge that this process starts early with healthy babies and children, being ready for kindergarten, third grade reading by third grade, high school graduation, post-secondary graduation, and later, the ability to advance through careers. Unfortunately, in our communities, these success determinants continue to show gaps based on race, ethnicity, gender, or zip code. We can continue the status quo that feeds these inequities, or we can be more deliberate, innovative, and bold about changing our trajectory for the future. We cannot afford to be passive. To give us a direct view of three cities in our state that are not being passive, but deliberate about changing the trajectory, I will now turn it over to Dr. Behrens and our three mayors. Mayor Bliss from Grand Rapids, Mayor Bobby Hopewell from Kalamazoo, and Mayor Andy Shore from Lansing. Welcome to the stage. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm, I'm Terry Behrens. I'm the executive director of the Johnson Center. Only my kids call me doctor. I make them do that. Um, so our, the mission of the Johnson Center is to understand, strengthen, and advance philanthropy. And we see um, philanthropy, a healthy philanthropic sector, as being core to successful, healthy communities. And so this topic of inclusive growth is really well aligned with our mission, and I'm eager to hear what your thoughts are on, on inclusive growth. So I'd like to start with asking you to each introduce yourself and your city. Tell us a little bit about the demographics, changes you've seen in recent years, uh, who the employers are. You want to start? I, will, I guess I'm sitting to your left, so yes. I get to start. For, I have to follow that video. That's the hardest thing ever. Um, I'm Andy Shore. I'm the mayor of the city of Lansing. I've uh, been mayor about a, almost two years now. So thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor. I've actually been in the audience for these things before, and, and it's always very impressive. Um, city of Lansing, uh, if you haven't been there, uh, we are the capital city, and we're, we're proud of that. So um, we have a lot going on with state government. Uh, our, our biggest employer is state government. Uh, in the region, uh, number two is, is MSU, uh, Sparrow Hospital, GM, so your traditional uh, employers in our city. We are about 118,000 as, uh, as of the most recent census estimate. Um, we are a tremendously diverse city. Um, we have in the, in the mid-20s for our African-American population, about 10% for our Latino population, 2 to 3% for Asian population and then a, um, you know, a sizable Caucasian population and, um, and just a ton of, of others. Um, my, uh, my kids both go to the Lansing Public Schools and I'm proud of that uh, because of the, the diversity that are in those schools. They speak about 50 to 60 different languages within those schools and again, we're, we're tremendously proud of that. Um, and I'm proud of the education that my student, my children are getting. Um, so that's, that's Lansing. I don't want to take up too much time, but, uh, but uh, okay, thank you for having me here. All right, thank you. Mayor Bliss. Nice. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I'm Mayor Bliss, so the mayor of our awesome city here in Grand Rapids. I'm in my fourth year as mayor. Um, many of you are from Grand Rapids, and so you're well aware of our, uh, of our city. But if you're not familiar with the demographics, uh, we are approaching 200,000 in populations. We're the second largest city in the state of Michigan next to our friends over there on the east side, Detroit. Uh, and we too are about 40%, if you break down our demographics, we're about 40% people of color, about 19% African Americans who live in our city, and about 16% Hispanic uh, and Latino. Uh, and there's a lot happening in our city. Uh, many of you know that. We see cranes all over the place. We know that we have incredible growth happening in both downtown, uh, and in our neighborhoods. So our city is made up of 32 amazing neighborhoods and we're starting to see pretty significant development really across our city. Uh, we make a lot of lists that we're proud of. There's some that we're not so proud of. 
Uh, and one of the recent ones was that we have one of the hottest zip codes in the state when it comes to real estate. Uh, and so we know that as our economy continues to strengthen, we have one of the strongest local economies, which we're also really proud of, and many of you in this room, um, you're the reason for that because of all of your work and dedication. Uh, but with that growth and also with a really tight housing market, this conversation about inclusive growth, I think, is really critical and relevant because we want to make sure that as our city grows, everyone benefits from that success. And how do we make sure that as we go through these growing pains and changes, how do we make sure that people aren't left out? And so I think that that's why this conversation is a really timely one. And I'm really glad to be up here on this stage with two of my colleagues. Uh, I've had the pleasure to work with both of them as mayor. We both serve on the Urban Core Mayors together, and then we're active um, at the state level and national level um, around many issues. So it's good to have them both in our city and to welcome them here to Grand Rapids. So I'll turn to Mayor Hopewell, my neighbor to the south. Good afternoon, everybody. I thought we were in, thought we were in Grand Rapids, Mayor. What's going on? Good afternoon, everybody. There we go. This is GR. We got to be all excited. So I'm Bobby Hopewell. I am the proud and uh, amazingly happy mayor of the city of Kalamazoo. I am the little brother to these two bigger, I'm the little big brother because, uh, you know, 100 something thousand, 200, we're 77. But I've been the mayor for 12 years, so that makes me the big brother of the mayors. Um, senior. Here. Senior, senior member. Senior, senior. senior member. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> See, notice they're interrupting me, I didn't interrupt them. <laughs> <laughs> little brother thing, or big brother. Um, but I'm also the mayor that is in his last six weeks as mayor. Um, I've opted not to run again, and it's been freaking me out for the last couple weeks. Um, we are a proud community in Kalamazoo, 45 miles from you all. We are the home of the Kalamazoo Promise. In our city, we have 20% of our folks are African American, about Four to five percent are Latino, and then um, Asian is anywhere in the realm of one percent. We have 30 percent poverty in our community, while we have major buildings going up in our downtown. We have over 50 plus percent of our African American children in poverty. Though we are the home of the Kalamazoo Promise and have been since 2005, we still have not gotten better with our African American male graduation rates, though we have increased steadily all of the other demographics in, that we measure. So though we have these issues and these challenges, we are doing a lot, and you're going to hear about that on this stage today. I'm proud to be up here with these three mayors. Uh, one of the distinctions we have all together is we're three of the few communities that had population growth last year. Um, we happen to have had the highest, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but my friends and colleagues that I uh, appreciate working with so much, there's, there's so many things going on. I'm excited to hear all of what you guys all are doing here in Grand Rapids and hear well about what's going on in Lansing, and we'll share a little bit about Kalamazoo. Thanks for having me today. All right, thank you. We're gonna dig in in just a minute into what, um, what work you're actually doing in your cities. But I'd like to ask each of you, like, what was your personal kind of aha moment about the need for inclusive growth strategies? Was there some piece of data, some incident? Like what, what kind of brought it home to you that this was an issue in your community? I'll, I'll, I'm happy to start. Uh, I, I, you know, there were a, a number of aha moments. I'll, I'll go back to um, two, 2015. Um, there were a couple things that happened that year. I was still, uh, so before being mayor, I was a city commissioner and I served as a commissioner for 10 years. So this was before I was elected as mayor. And um, that year in 2015, two critical reports came out. One was done by the Michigan Department of Civil Rights and it was a countywide analysis of the high cost of disparities in our community. And uh, the, a group from that work came and presented to the city commission and it was, it was shocking to me. 
Uh, I, I believe anecdotally, I had, I had known just my background in social work, I knew that there were significant racial disparities in multiple outcomes, whether it's in healthcare, um, economic opportunity, wages, home ownership. Uh, but the, the data and, and how it was presented was so unbelievably compelling. Uh, and once you know, it's hard not to step up and do something about it. So that was an aha moment. And then uh, that was the same year that a Forbes report came out and it said that Grand Rapids was um, one of the worst cities for African Americans to thrive and be successful. And to me, that was, that was really a, a call to action. And uh, I, I started taking a deeper dive into better understanding uh, the racial disparities that exist in our city. And it led me to a book, A City Within a City, which is a really uh, powerful book in my opinion. Uh, because I do believe that in, in order to create a different future and, and think about how things need to be different, um, to have a more positive outcome for folks, you really need to understand your past. And a city within a city helped me do that and really understand um, what brought us to where we are today as a community. Uh, and, and so it was a lot of, a lot of uh, reflection and looking in the mirror and, uh, and then figuring out, okay, how do I be a part of this solution and how do I move us forward, forward in a way that eliminates racial disparities, which is connected to this whole um, conversation about inclusive growth. Right, so there's really some data that, that mm -hmm. made you move. Yeah. I know who wants to go next, Mayor Hope? Well, mine is a little, little different, and it didn't have much to do with data, though I knew that the data existed. It dealt with some one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations that started cropping up, um, or I should just say conversations at events or in the community when I was talking with individuals about their journey, about their pathway to success, about what's going on in their lives. And you can hear the passion and the ideas, the ideation, the interest in doing something. And then they say, but Mayor, I'm challenged because of this. I have, uh, I, I, I made a mistake. Any of us made a mistake ever? Yeah, I thought maybe one or two of you might have. Um, and their mistake landed them in that wonderful place of prison. And it was 20 years ago, Mayor, and I can't find a way forward um, because it's a, a, a scarlet letter. Or you'd hear someone that was able, would, got into debt and couldn't get out of it. Or the opposite, uh, someone starts a business, uses all cash, and then they try to go and get some gap financing for a new project, oh, you have no debt. And then, of course, the other debt, when you go to prison to pay your debt, you get out and you can't pay your debts because no one will hire you. So those conversations were happening too much with me. So my aha moment was, you know, you have I, me, I have this opportunity to serve this community and not in those spaces, but I'm no better than you. I've made every kind of mistake and not ended up in a place that doesn't allow you to find a path forward. So it was really, the aha was really, we are throwing away people that have value, meaning, and can contribute. And we can't allow that to happen anymore. Okay, thank you, Mayor Sharon. <laughs> It's also always hard to follow Bobby Hopewell. <laughs> You're all learning that. Um, you know, I, it, the aha moment for me was, was stark, but before the aha moment, you, you, I, you always, I always knew there was, there was a problem, that there were some people who could get ahead and some people who couldn't. When you talk about inclusive growth, you know, we're doing a tremendous amount of growth in Lansing. Um, we are the most affordable city in the nation, um, which has its positives and negatives, to be honest with you. Uh, I served in the legislature for five years, and you, we had a lot of discussions about, um, about growth and, and equity, and um, it's all very hypothetical when you're in the legislature. Uh, and I got into, I became mayor, and um, you know, when you run for office, you hear all the stories, um, everybody's individual story. Um, and when I, when I won, you know, the city had already been doing a lot of work revolving around um, bringing everybody up. Someone before said, all boats rise. Um, so we had two, 
priority neighborhoods where we knew we had low-income individuals who, um, who were not getting ahead, who were not, um, who were not generating wealth. And, and the city's done a lot over the last few years, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that. Uh, two areas uh, specifically, and we have an Office of Financial Empowerment, which is where we teach people to how to, to get ahead. And I could talk more about that. But my aha moment was about um, two months ago. Um, again, I've always known there's an issue, and we know there's poverty, and we know we have to get ahead. But um, we had a, a young lady from Harvard who was interning at, in Lansing, um, part of the Harvard, the Bloomberg Harvard Leadership Program. Thank you, Mayor Bliss. Um, she recommended me, so thank you. Um, but when you go through that, they give you some resources, and we had a young lady from Harvard. She's actually from um, Jordan, the country, but she's studying at Harvard. And she was in Lansing for six weeks, and I really didn't even know what she was doing. You know, she's here, she's generating data, she's looking at numbers, and she gave us a presentation before she left, and she identified a place in Lansing on the north side called Census District 68. And I'm gonna tell you something that even the folks in Lansing don't know yet. This district was backwards in every way. This district was high in poverty, was low in educational attainment, had very few resources. You know, in our other areas of priority, we had put together nonprofits and philanthropies and others, and we had really boosted resources. This area had nothing, and we didn't know it. We didn't know it. She found it, and she said, these people are struggling, and we're not doing anything to help. And that was my aha moment. And that's what we're going to, to work on, solving some of those problems, using data. I go right back to the data. We didn't know. Um, and I mean, I've knocked doors in that area, and I know that, that people are, are struggling, but not to the point of looking at this data and saying, oh my God, it really points it out. Um, so that's gonna be uh, our moving forward. You know, we, Lansing is one of few communities. We take one and a quarter percent of our general fund by ordinance, and we put that into social services every year. So it's about $3 million that goes directly into social services. We don't rely on the county for it, we do it ourselves. And we're gonna be targeting. That money is like shotgun, like you give it to every agency and they do some good here and there. We're gonna focus some of those dollars in my budget uh, coming up because we always say, you know, budgets are, budget, the budget you propose shows the priorities of your, your community. Mm -hmm. And we're done letting those people fall behind when everybody else, the downtown and different areas of the city, when they're growing, we're done letting those people fall behind. So that was my aha moment. Okay, thanks. I'd like to turn directly to hearing about some of the strategies that you're using to address inclusive growth. And I've heard there are citywide strategies, there are neighborhood-based strategies. I'm really interested in hearing about sort of how did you decide where to start, how to start, um, as, as you tried to tackle these issues. They're gonna stare down now about who okay. goes first. Um, <laughs> so we um, just went through a, a visioning process called Imagine Kalamazoo 2025. And in that process, we convened the entire community uh, around setting the vision, the strategic vision for our city. Normally we have about 300 participants in a process like that. Planning Commission does their work and what have you, and uh, actually we had over 4,000 voices in many different ways because we set it up to really go out into the community and ask questions and engage and connect and build relationships. Out of that came 10 strategic goal goals that we are moving forward, one of which is called shared prosperity. So we're not going to solve, we're not targeting poverty, we're targeting prosperity that everyone should have a pathway to do that. So we have everything from looking at our young people and their needs. We know transportation is a huge challenge for them to meet their passion and get engaged. So now all of our high school students ride our bus for free, eliminating one barrier. It's all about the barriers, the gaps. We're working on returnees coming back from prison that I talked about earlier through a people of, it's called People of Change, it's a program through our shared prosperity effort where we're granting some dollars to this organization to dive in deep on those that arrive back from prison. And let me tell you, I serve on the uh, Community Corrections Board for the state. We couldn't even get information about who was coming back. So I thought that was interesting. You know where they are because you got a fence around them bars, but you can't tell me when they're leaving the fence and the bars makes no logical sense in, in my head at all, none. 
Um, we have new <laughs> funds for entrepreneurs targeted at neighborhood businesses and individuals that are trying to move their idea and they have gaps in that financing. In one of our neighborhoods, we're doing a medical academy where we're teaching young people and residents in the neighborhood how to become medical assistants. And, but the difference is, those, those programs happen in the, in the city, but the difference is we're bringing it to the neighborhood level. Um, man, I could go on and on, which I have my notes here. We have He's got uh, 12 pages of and, notes and on this. And I'm not going to go gonna... on and on. <laughs> um, young people are a huge target of ours as well. So we have programs to help with the summer slide. Most of our recreation programs now are free in the city, are free. That's due to what we call the foundation for excellence. You can Google it because it's too hard to explain everything. And those are just the tactical side of things. The goal is large. The dynamics of relationships that we're building in the community with Michigan Works and the Momentum program that has had such success and is a national model of working with folks that are hard to employ. It's all about all of us diving in. And what I love about the business community right now, and I'm going to stop after this, mm -hmm. Our Momentum program works with businesses in the community. About four years ago, they were working with five companies. Now, they're working with 50 plus companies because of the need that you have for talent. Talent. It's key. I think that's the reason why we're seeing such partnerships form is because you need people. We have a skills trade academy or skills targeted program where we're helping those that have wanted to become contractors, wanted to be welders, wanted to be carpenters, had a gig in their license, they couldn't afford the licensing, or gig on their record, they couldn't afford the licensing um, exams, all of these things, and we're removing those barriers for 16 individuals right now. They're paying nothing to practice the te for the practice test, we're gonna pay for their licensing, and we have the home builders and businesses working with us. This is us together. That's how we solve inclusive growth. That's how we solve the opportunity pathway. That's how we solve prosperity. It's all of us, business, cities, government, non, um, non-profit organizations, all of us. That's how we do this work. Here you go, Mayor. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of collaborations and you're focusing on some specific populations, Absolutely. returning prisoners and youth. Um, I guess you were nominated. I got nominated, uh, designated. <laughs> um, so we, you know, we're we're doing a lot of work um, in this space, and it's because it's important to our community. Um, I mentioned we have an office of financial empowerment. Um, well, first let me say uh, there's an old adage with mayors that I have learned in my year and a half, two years, and that is, um, good mayors borrow, <laughs> great mayors steal. That's what they say. You go to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, it's like yeah. the first thing they tell you. Um, so Mayor Garcetti from L.A. Led the, opened the last conference and said, welcome fellow thieves. Um, <laughs> and that's true, because we don't all need to reinvent the wheel. So in Lansing, we have an Office of Financial Empowerment, which we were one of the first to create with a grant from, from the Bloomberg Philanthropies, which has been fantastic, which helps people. I met a young lady um, when I first came in. She actually works for the city. We were going department to department to meet the employees. She was telling us how she came out of college and, and, um, and she was in a world of hurt. She owed money and, and she, she couldn't afford a house and she was renting and, and it was the nightmare scenario. And someone introduced her to our Office of Financial Empowerment and they taught her how to utilize tools to save and budget. And you know, she was, she was wide-eyed and excited and I've just, I just got my first house and I'm paying the mortgage and I'm saving money and I've got my first car. I'm not using public transit. Um, it's wildly successful. Um, and that's, that's really important. And we, we send that to, to folks everywhere we go. Um, whenever we deal with people, we said you need to work through our office of financial empowerment. But in Lansing, um, we, we utilize what we call a, a cradle to career approach to inclusive growth. Um, and we have a great graphic that you don't see, but um, we, we show this nationally, actually. Um, and it's called the Shape Continuum. So we start at the bottom with Lansing Save. Lansing Save is a, uh, it's a, an educational savings account. Every child who goes in the, who's in the Lansing Public Schools automatically gets a savings account. 
MSU, FCU gives them $5 where they start and they save over the years that they're in school, money is put in randomly. We've got a church who's doing Fifth Sunday collections and puts that money into the Lansing save accounts for their kids. <coughs> We've got businesses who are engaged. Again, MSUFCU seeds it. Um, we, are, we stole that. We stole that one from San Francisco, and we actually have one of the highest percentages of participation in the country. Now, unfortunately, highest percentage of participation is like 40% but that is one of the highest. But when you get parents who are putting a dollar or two dollars, they come to our annual save events because they get another five dollars into the account and they're putting a dollar here and a dollar there. They're teaching their child to save. Um, and it's tremendously important. We move from that to, um, to the Capital Area College Access Network, which places college advisors in every high school to assist with FAFSA and, and financial aid and other things so kids can get ahead. We move to the Lansing Promise, um, which is stolen from Kalamazoo. Thank you very much. Um, the Lansing Promise, which gets you um, free tuition at MSU or Lansing Community College or Olivet College. Um, and then we move to our Financial Empowerment Center, uh, which I already explained. And these all coexist with the Lansing School's Pathway Promise, which is where uh, each of the different schools have different specialties and kids can go to any one of the schools that they want. So my daughter uh, was at Post Oak Elementary where she was in Chinese immersion from being, from from uh, kindergarten, first grade. Uh, my son was at Mount Hope, which was a STEAM program. Now, trust me, as a parent, it's a pain in the neck bringing your kids to two different schools. But, and all the, somebody laughed because they know it. Um, but, but you're getting your kids different education. Now, thank goodness, they're at one school, Everett High School, but they're both in the new tech program where they're learning high technology. They could be at Eastern High School where they would be doing an international baccalaureate degree, which you can't get anywhere else, at least in the mid-Michigan area. That, along with all the programs that we have, they all work together. Um, so this is the cradle to career. And we also have programs similar to Kalamazoo. We have, we're working with the Department of Corrections for a returning citizens program. What a hugely important program. Returning citizens. What do you hear most from people? You know, get a job. And um, these people are coming back from prison and, and they're just a drain to society. Well, how about before they get back from prison, we train them to be a building trades person. Because um, we have huge shortages. You're growing, right? Grand Rapids is growing like leaps and bounds. You have the same problems we do. You can't find the people to work on the projects. Um, our developers are, are all over the place trying to find labor. What if you train those people who are coming back who don't have a skill to have a skill? They can be a welder, they can be a carpenter, they can be an electrician. Now they're coming back and they're having an opportunity to earn a living. They are getting that second chance. This is the need and the have, and you are connecting the two. And again, we are, we're proud to do it. So we had a fair where we matched employers and developers and trades, unions, all right with the returning citizens. And you know what? It's working. It's working. Because when you come back and you start as a welder, you're making $80,000 a year. And I'm jealous. Um, you know, and you're not having that college debt that, uh, that, you know, that some kids have. I had a huge debt when I came out of college at the University of Michigan. Go blue, except for last weekend. Um, <laughs> But uh, I had a huge debt coming out of school, so I had to pay that off. These people, these are returning citizens or kids that we're getting to come out and, and go into the trades. Be a doctor if you want, be a lawyer if you want, be a welder <laughs> and learn a skill. So these are all tools that we work with a lot of different entities, including the business community, to make sure that, that we right size and people are doing better than their parents. Well, I'll add um, a couple things. Uh, I'll talk a little bit internally about what's happening at City Hall, and then uh, there's just incredible work happening throughout our community um, with many of the partners who are here in this room who are leading the charge. Uh, so at City Hall, I'm happy uh, to have my colleague with us today, Commissioner Jones, uh, who serves with me on the commission. And we have spent a lot of time looking at how do we make sure that we're making good decisions. And um, recently, about a year ago, when our city manager came and joined us, uh, Mr. Mark Washington, First thing we tackled is really looking at our strategic plan and making sure that equity was embedded into everything that we're doing and that it's really clearly defined in all of our goals related to the six domains that we focus on and economic development being one of them. Um, in, in the city, our economic development team and department works really closely with a lot of folks in the community looking at how do we support inclusive growth but also um, access and how do we remove barriers. So we're happy to work in partnership with the Hispanic Chamber and with Ferris and with the Grand Rapids Chamber as we try to use our resources to really leverage the resources in the community to build wealth, but also to open up doors for entrepreneurs and startups to make sure that our city is a great place where people can thrive. 
Uh, a lot of these issues are intertwined, so as we look at access, we have to look at, at mobility and our public transit system, and uh, we have to look at um, access to, um, to capital for our entrepreneurs. Uh, and the city can't do that alone, so we do it in partnership with a lot of folks in this room. Uh, speaking of cradle to career, you know, we have K-Connect that is doing incredible work in our community. Uh, our community was, was supportive of an early childhood millage who I think is at, that I think is absolutely essential to making sure that children start off uh, and are able to read. And then we too are in the process of sealing the Promise Zone from Kalamazoo. So uh, we had our very first Promise Zone Authority meeting about a week and a half ago, and we're really hoping to make sure that that is available to students who grow up in our city as well, that they have access to higher education um, at no cost. Uh, and then all the workforce development work that's happening in our community with a lot of our higher ed partners and also our, our trades. Uh, and that's really what it takes. It takes all of us really being intentional and focusing. And I would say in the last four to five years, we've seen more of that. You know, almost every single conversation is talking about how do we make sure that we're removing barriers and that we're looking at inequities. Um, and I think that's what's really inspiring. Yeah. So you, you've all talked about quite a few different programs happening in your cities. Do you, how do you know they're working <coughs> <laughs> and that they're reaching the people who need it most? Metrics, uh, mm -hmm. metrics. We, you know, data driven. We are very, we're, we, we are getting to be very data driven. Um, you know, in the past, a lot of the the folks who give you the grant money, they force you to be data driven. So every HUD dollar we get, and every Bloomberg grant or whatever, um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, every everyone who works with us uh, insists on data. But it's very data driven, um, and you have to be careful with that. Because you don't only you don't just want to deal with data, you want to deal with reality. But you also need to prove that that what you're doing is working. Um, so we we track, we assess, um, and we move based on on data for the most part. Um, and uh, and it's been successful to identify, especially for us, kind of where in the city there's a need. Um, one of the great programs we haven't talked about is is opportunity zones at the federal level, and that is the first. Uh, well, not the first, but the most recent federal program that allows us to target um, dollars into areas that have not traditionally had growth. So when you talk about inclusive growth, it's not just low-income people. I've got areas of the city, you know, developers, I love them. They all want to develop in my downtown, and I want a, a credible downtown, but my south side has not seen the, the development that uh, we would like, and now we've got census tracts designated as opportunity zones, and all of a sudden, I've got people who are interested in parts of the south side or parts of the north side that haven't been before. We have a project going up in a building that's probably sat vacant for 30 years, um, and an opportunity fund helped to, helped to bridge, the, uh, bridge the financial gap in that project. So now you have inclusive growth in areas of the city where we haven't had it before. And again, that's all based on, on metrics and and data, and, um, and those census tracts were designated um, because, of, uh, because of the populations, because of the investments and things like that. So we do a lot of data. Yeah, and I, I, I'll echo that. So in the city of Grand Rapids, we have, we have 17 <coughs> neighborhoods of focus. That's what we call them. So we have 17 census tracts in the city of Grand Rapids that we know uh, we have families that are struggling the most. And, and really, fortunately, you spoke earlier about the importance of true collaboration with private sector, public sector, and philanthropy, um, a lot of this work has been supported by philanthropy. So Kellogg, Kellogg Foundation, uh, they supported um, some significant data and research looking at our city and demographics and, and looking at the needs of uh, the 17 neighborhoods of focus or these 17 census tracts. And at the city, we've used that data to really drive a number of decisions. Uh, we've done a number of things looking at, you know, how do we make sure that we're doing public investments in the neighborhoods of focus? How do we um, support neighborhood connections and ambassadors in those neighborhoods? Um, the city commission last year supported a third ward equity fund, knowing that the third ward has been a portion of our city that for a long time has been disinvested in. And so, you know, it, 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 it is twofold. You need the data. You need to show that what you're, you're, you're doing is working, and if it's not working, you need to pivot and pivot quickly. Um, but then also you need to make sure that you're staying connected 
to those neighborhoods and to the families there and listening to see if it's having a, a genuine impact on their lives. Uh, and, and a lot of that comes from survey data or other types of uh, resources you can use to get a community input. Um, community engagement is one of our, our priorities at the city, so we spend a lot of time in our neighborhoods making sure that we're listening um, and getting feedback. Uh, and so it is, it is really twofold, but the, the data piece is significant. And uh, even as we look at access to opportunity, there's a lot going on in our community around opening up doors and creating greater access and greater opportunity, but how do we make sure that we're measuring that to know that people are not just getting in for an interview and getting a job, but they actually have an opportunity to grow and develop and to, and to uh, build wealth and to, to make not just a living wage, but a, a, a really good wage where they can support their families. Okay, you're hoping to add anything about that? Yeah, just adding in, um, we are in the process of uh, working through a million dollar grant that we, we received from a philanthropist in Kalamazoo to help us develop the best practices and data platforms we could design and develop. We really have been working to uh, examine best practices in other communities. We just went to Austin. Um, we are looking at some things that Grand Rapids is doing. Uh, really wanting to make sure that as we're delivering these uh, impacts, that they truly are impacts. Uh, in a, about two weeks, we'll be rolling out our data platform that relates to the Foundation for Excellence and the work that's happened there. I think it's like $70 million worth of investment and measuring what every neighborhood has gained from the foundation where you'll be able to click on a, a data map and look at the Millwood neighborhood or our, one of our three challenge neighborhoods or um, the downtown and see what the tax burden has been or the tax obligation or uh, aspirational projects that have occurred in each neighborhood as they develop their individual neighborhood plans with our teams so that their voice is determining the pathway for their entire neighborhood. Everything from economic growth and, and um, social equity as it relates to being a part of that, and streets and sidewalks to building infrastructure, all of those things. And the opportunity zones, what well, we have to be careful as mayors, we have a lot of interest now in these zones. But we have to make sure that interest is inclusive of those that live there. That's the challenge for us, that just because you have this grand opportunity that you can't have it just for someone who wants to come in. We want to partner with them to ensure they're impacting mm -hmm. the neighborhood in the best possible ways as uh, each neighborhood progresses through their plans and through their vision for where they live. Can I, can so, I add in one other thing? Sure, then um, it, it, question. We're talking a lot about these big programs uh, this all isn't just big programs. This is also no. basic city services. You know, we've got 111 parks in the city of Lansing, so there's a park within 10 minute walk for every resident who lives there. And we've done most of our work surrounding parks in some of these areas of people who are not usually included. So, you know, we just created, it's called Beacon Field. Um, it's a soccer field where, you know, it's kind of a circular all year pickup soccer field, which was sponsored by the business community. They helped to raise the money. Um, we created a park around there with what's called a Kaboom playground. We did this in an area of the city which has not traditionally had investment. So this is using your basic city services like parks to make sure that there is investment and growth. You know, we, and these things, these parks are used year round. Even when there's snow on the ground, they will use these parks because it's a basic city service that we can provide um, in those areas. Can I add one more thing about that? Uh, <laughs> All right, and and this, is, this is why it's important to use data as well. So, so in a lot of city services, historically, we have been, I'll give you an example, we've been a complaint-based system, right? So your street lights out, you call the city, and we respond. Your sidewalk needs to be replaced, we call. A stri street tree is dead, you call the city, we'll respond. And if you really look at data, this is why it's important to couple data when you're making policy decisions, and, and how it ties to equity. If you look at the data, very <laughs> often, families in poor neighborhoods who have 100 other things on their plate, they're stressed out, they're worried about 10 different things other than the street light that is, is not working on their street, they don't tend to call as often. So just unintentionally, individuals who live in more affluent communities, when you have a complaint-based system, they get a higher level of service 
from the city. And so their infrastructure, the broken playground or the swing set or the tree that's dead is fixed more quickly and they get a better service for no other reason than they picked up the phone and called. And so when you're looking at policy, you have to look at unintended consequences. A proactive system that goes through every single neighborhood and doesn't rely on somebody to pick up the phone, they're not gonna have a street light or multiple street lights out for weeks and weeks or months and months on end. They're not gonna have crumbling sidewalks. They're gonna, so, so again, when you, when you look at data and equity and policy making, they really are intricately in, uh, intertwined and you always have to be thinking about unintended consequences of a policy. And that's some of the work um, that we're doing and that we actually talk about at length. Um, it's not just a conversation we're having locally, but we're also having these conversations at the state level too with mayors from all over the country. Great, great example. Yeah, I think one of the, we could do a whole session and maybe at some point on opportunity zones and some of the challenges of really making sure oh, yeah. that it's equitable growth there. Um, a lot of challenges with that. Um, but let, let's pick up on the policy thread. There's a great example of a, a local policy that, that changed that you made to, for, uh, to provide city services more equitably. Are there other policy changes or policy opportunities that you see either uh, at the local, state level, maybe even the federal level, that would really help promote more equitable growth? Things that might be getting in your way right now or just where you see opportunities for policy work? Do you want to start? I, I was going to talk about corrections, but this has been, you've been leading this charge. Why don't you talk a little bit about the, some of the work that we're supporting around corrections reform? Well, I'll talk um, um, from a local and state level. So in the city, what we're, what we're doing, we've charged our city attorney to look at all of our ordinances to determine what should be a criminal, criminal offense compared to a civic a civil offense. And we just had just crazy stuff that was criminal offenses. You know, some things, just write a ticket. You know, and so we are, I think we've changed over 30 of our ordinances, and this was gonna be one of my things I was gonna recommend um, as one of those ideas for, for the mayors. Look at what you're doing locally and how you're putting that scarlet letter on someone. The other thing I'm excited about is that we've been really pushing at the urban core mayors, which, is the, which are the 13 largest urban communities in our state, at criminal justice reform. The governor's been talking about it. They have a special panel task force that uh, the lieutenant governor is leading. And we are providing our voice from the 13 communities that deal with this. But the interesting thing that I like to remind everybody, there's crime wherever you live. You may live in the most affluent section of Grand Rapids or East Grand Rapids or Kentwood or wherever else, you have crime. Sometimes we don't like to let folks know but it happens, it happens. And so we really need to take this on as an opportunity for all of our communities, not just those that are urban cores. There are three bills that are going to be rolling through the House. Uh, Representative Filler has introduced these bills and um, the urban core mayors are supporting them to deal with expungements. Expungement is really a set aside of your conviction. It's still on your record, but only law enforcement will be able to see it. So when you go to apply for that job and those of you that have the box still there that says check that I've had a, you need to get rid of that box. There's my other thing. And the box. You need to get rid of that box because you're losing great people if you don't get rid of that box. Doesn't mean you can't have the conversation about a criminal record. But that should come later, after you sat at a table with your team and they say, that's the right person. That woman's the right person for this job. Oh, they had a little something 20 years ago. But wait a minute, they were the right person. They did better in the interview than anybody. We need to figure out that 20 year thing because you know, it, uh, uh, it's, it's there and they are the right person for the job. But these bills will help decrease the time it takes to get an expungement. You can bundle some things together. So if you committed a crime or two crimes in a 24 hour period, you can bundle it as one expungement. And it doesn't, it doesn't cover everything. 
And some people will say that this is weak on crime. I think that's ridiculous. Because if you went away and you paid your debt, I'm not sure that we should, I'm not sure if you pay your student loan debt that you're a bad person because you had debt in the first place. Or maybe you are. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to give the so, a chance anyway, to respond to that. To other than me say I'm, you know. I'm, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm getting the signal here. So oh, okay. Real quick, any, any um, po other I, policy you know, things that you I, might highlight? Yeah, I, I'll just add, we haven't had a, a chance to talk about it at length up here today, but housing is a really critical policy Absolutely. issue. And, you know, ultimately, when we look at our cities, we want to make sure that we have mixed income, um, mixed housing types throughout our city. So regardless of how much money you make, if you want to call Grand Rapids home, we want you to be able to find a place to live here. If you um, are looking at a job and you just got hired, we want to make sure that if you want to live close to where you're working, you have that opportunity. And housing continues to be a real struggle, especially for a growing city. And so really thinking about housing policy to make sure that we are um, ensuring that we are still an affordable city, uh, regardless of the size of your family, that you can find a place to live here. And, we are doing a lot of work around that that we can't get into today, but I think when you look at um, inclusive growth, we have to include policies around uh, not just workforce development and access to opportunity, but also housing and transit. And again, they are just interconnected. Oh, they're connected. Okay, any uh, thank policy? you all for clapping. Thank you all for clapping on Ban the Box. Um, that's something we're not allowed to do. I was in the legislature when locals were prohibited from banning the box. So yeah, thanks. if you, uh, I did not I vote know. for that. I, I did not vote for that. <laughs> Uh, but if you really, if you clapped and you really do believe we should ban the box, please call your state legislator because only the legislature and the state can ban the box, which is sad but true. Um, the last thing I'll say, we, we're doing, um, we are what's called a CAFI grant recipient. Cities addressing fines and fees equitably and we're really doing a, an inward look at ourselves. We're looking at district court debt for ordinance violations by address, uh, by address, race, gender, and age. We use a heat map. So we're going to be looking internally to see where are we being unequitable. Um, and I think that's really important because you don't want to, you don't want to fine and fee someone um, who can't afford it and then start them into the spiral into homelessness. So we don't want to do that ourselves. Um, so I, I think that that's great. The expungement stuff is fantastic. Getting people second chances and back into the workforce. These are all policy areas that, that we're, we're involved in and um, we should all be involved in. And we're working together okay. on it. And we're all okay. working together. I'm, I'm, I'm testifying <laughs> on behalf of these two tomorrow morning because yes, yes. okay. I happen to live in Lansing and that's where the legislature is, so you know. All right, we're getting the hook here, but I'd like to actually offer each of you one sentence, no uh, semicolons and you know, multiple clauses, <laughs> one sentence um, of advice for those who are interested in uh, contributing to more equitable, inclusive growth. Lord, one sentence. I'll, I'll start. Uh, it, it takes all of us. It really does. We all need to be engaged if we're gonna, if the future is gonna look different. What she said. Okay. <laughs> uh, the business community is tremendously important in this effort. Everything we're doing in government can't be done without the business community. So we need your help. Thank you for today. All right. Well, please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you. Thank you, mayors, and thank you, Terry. Um, it's going to be really important to learn from each other as we do this uh, community by community. It's very important. Inclusive growth is an outcome, and it comes from all the things that you heard them talk about and even more. So as I close, I want to leave you with three things. Please bear with me. So what does this have to do with you? Number one, this audience comes from a variety of sectors where you have power to change the trajectory of our future. You are leaders, you are influencers, you are doers. And collectively, we can increase prosperity for more people in our community. Number two, keep learning. Please keep learning about what's going on in our community and how you can be involved to combat inequities by increasing access and opportunities for more people. We can, you can learn more by uh, going to these locations that are on your screen. Currently, and through November, the Johnson Center is focusing on inclusive growth and other related topics with articles, blogs, and resources. 
And also on our website, you can also learn about gatherings such as uh, brown bag lunches that you can come to and learn more from others. And please follow the excellent work of K-Connect, a strong coalition in our community. They're facilitating and advancing collaborative work with agendas and action to create pathways for economic prosperity. And number three, be connected. If you'd like to be on our mailing list and get announcements and invitations to our activities, please leave your business card at the center of the table and we'll come around and pick them up. There's a lot of good work going on in our community and our goal is to bring all that good work together to be more effective and to improve prosperity for more people in our community. So let's thank our mayors one more time and all the work they do. Thank you, thank you for your attention, and I'll turn it over to T. Haas. <laughs> All right, well, that'll end uh, this uh, particular session, but I wanna thank uh, Juan and the uh, Johnson Center for creating this space for this conversation. And I do have uh, three uh, memberships for a young person for junior achievement that we give to uh, our guests. And uh, Juan, if we could share these with each of the mayors, uh, from uh, a gift from us to you that will keep on giving with the young people who would be part of Junior Achievement. So thank you all. Have a great rest of the day. By the way, today's the first day of fall, so enjoy it. <laughs>